Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. And the title of my message is The Biblical Worldview on Singleness, Marriage, and Divorce. Heard about a teacher that was speaking to her fourth grade Sunday school class on the topic of marriage. So she turned to the kids and said, Can anyone tell me what God says about marriage? A little boy raised up his hand. She called on him. And he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. <laughs> Judging by the way some marriages go, you can understand why the little boy would have said something like that. Maybe that's why J. Paul Getty, one of the richest men who ever lived, once said, I would give my entire fortune for one happy marriage. One happy marriage. Is it possible? How many of you are married? Raise up your hand. Okay. All right. How many of you are happily married? Raise up your hand. Wow. You're better off than J. Paul Getty. How many of you are single? Raise up your hand. Okay. How many of you are single and want to get married? Raise up your hand. Oh my. How many of you are married and wish you were single again? Right? Don't. 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 Well, the Bible has something to say to every one of you here today. And I think that I can speak with some authority on the subject because number one, I know a little bit about divorce. I haven't been divorced, thank God for that. But uh, my mom was married and divorced seven times. So I saw divorce up close and personal. And I'll tell you what, it ain't pretty. And it was that experience that caused me to want to have a successful marriage and to work as hard as I could to make that possible. And number two, my wife and I have been married for 36 years. And uh, thank God for that. <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing when, when I'm out with my wife and someone will ask, well, how long have you been married? And we tell them 36 years. They look at us like we came from another planet. And you know, there are people that have been married longer than I have, but it's becoming more and more of a rarity to see a couple that's been together that long. Also factor in that my wife doesn't even look 36, much less believing she's been married for 36 years. So you know, this is an important topic. And let's just establish one thing. Our secular culture has nothing to say to us about marriage. I hope you're not looking to the celebrities of the world for your cues because you're going to find out what not to do for the most part. They can't keep a relationship together, much less a marriage. It's not that you're going out wanting to keep up with what they're all doing, but when you just stand in line at the supermarket, you're going to look at the cover of People and Us and other magazines telling us about the latest hookup or breakup. And some of these relationships uh, ship seems to last days, not even months. So clearly our culture has nothing to say. We need to do it another way. We need to do it God's way. So in this message I want to talk about singleness, marriage, and divorce. Why divorce? Because Jesus dealt with it. And actually all these things interconnect. You see, if, as a single person you do the right things and, and get married and then do the right things, you won't end up as a divorced person. So I want to try to nip this at the bud for some of you that are still unattached. And for you that are married, I want to share some principles that I think can strengthen your marriage. I wish we could take the word divorce and strike it from our vocabulary. You know why? Wedlock should be a padlock. I repeat, wedlock should be a padlock. Don't state those vows if you don't mean them. When you say to your husband or wife to be, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. However, the Bible does give allowance for divorce. There are times when there's no avoiding it. And we'll get to that later and give two reasons the Bible allows for, for a divorce to take place. But before we get to that, let's just talk about a single person. I believe you singles out there, that God has someone picked for you, hand-selected. Maybe you're sitting next to them right now. Maybe you've never met them. Maybe you already know them. But there is that person out there. And because of that, you can start praying for that person. Maybe not by name, but you can start asking the Lord to bless them because I have that person, or the Lord has that person. Now I know it's hard to be lonely. 
It, you know, you wish there was someone to spend time with. You know, your theme song is Lonely, I Mister Lonely. That's how you feel. And maybe you think to yourself, if only I were married, then I would be happy. The problem is, some of those people that are married are saying, if only I was single again, then I would be happy. Marriage is like flies on a screen door. Those that are on the outside want to get in, and those on the inside want to get out. The grass is always greener on the other side, it seems. But there are advantages to being married, no, uh, married, no question. And I'll say to you honestly, if I had a choice, I'd be married over being single any day of the week. However, there are also advantages to being single. You say, what advantages? Well, for one thing, you have more time to concentrate on your relationship with God. Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 7 from a modern translation. When you're unmarried, you're free to concentrate on simply pleasing the Lord. Marriage involves you in all the nuts and bolts of domestic life and in wanting to please your spouse, leading to so many more demands in your attention. The time and energy that married people spend on caring for and nurturing each other, the unmarried can spend in becoming holy instruments of God. I'm not trying to be helpful, or excuse me, I'm trying to be helpful and make it as easy as possible for you, not make, not make things harder. All I want for you is to be able to develop a way of life in which you can spend plenty of time together with the Master without a lot of distractions. Now, Paul is not being critical of a person who wants to please their spouse. That's what you're supposed to be doing. You need to spend time nurturing that relationship. But if you're a single person, you have a certain mobility a married person does not have. Here's the bottom line. You need to be content where you are right now, single or married. Be content. The Apostle Paul said, I have found in whatever state I'm in, therein to be content. In Hebrews 13, 5, we read, Let your way of living be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. You see, your contentment should not come from a relationship with a person. It should come from your relationship with God. There is a place for a man. There is a place for a woman. As we'll see in a few moments, they will meet needs in your life that need to be met. However, the deepest needs of your life can only be met by God Himself. Isn't it interesting how little girls want to become princesses? I've been getting schooled in this lately. Having raised boys, I didn't know much about little girls and their love of the color pink and their fondness for tiaras and princess dresses and having tea and so forth. And uh, But now I'm with my granddaughters. I'm discovering it. And the other day I was with Stella dressed up in a princess dress, of course. And we're playing with a little castle and little princess figures. And, and I'm playing the prince figures. And, and I taught her the little song, One day my prince will come. You know, and she's singing it the rest of the day. She's just singing it over and over and over again. And there's something in the heart of a little girl that longs for her prince to come and rescue her. Maybe that's a longing for a greater prince, the Prince of Peace and the Lord of Lords. Maybe that's a longing for God, don't you think? And also, as a guy, you're longing for something more. Maybe you're thinking, when I meet her, I know I'll be happy. She's going to do all of this for me. No, no. A girl can do certain things for you. You're longing for God Himself. Our joy should come from our relationship with God. And we need to be realistic about our relationship with our husband or our wife. So if you're single, what qualities should you be looking for in someone that you might eventually end up with. Well, according to a survey that was done among singles, the three things that most singles look for today are number one, beauty, number two, brains, and number three, disposable cash. Beauty, brains, and money. Interesting. Not one mention is made of inner qualities or a person's spiritual state. And I can tell you after being married for 36 years that Nothing is more important than those things. Beauty is great. I happen to think my wife is more beautiful 
than she's ever been. She kind of got the short end of that deal on my part. But it's wonderful to see a woman grow in her beauty inwardly as well as outwardly. You see, in, in our day when we want to deny the passing of time and, and we don't want to admit we're getting older, this is hard. Girls, instead of becoming cougars, how about becoming women of virtue? You know what a cougar is? It's an expression to describe an older woman, woman who is basically preying on younger guys. I uh, read an article in USA Today the other day about a cougar cruise. And it was a bunch of these women uh, who were trying to find some guy and a bunch of young guys that they described as cubs. Uh, as I read more about their activities, it was kind of disturbing, quite honestly. And uh, they would wear these little black wristbands. I'm available. And you know what? Sad, really, to me. Come on. Become a, a woman of inner beauty. Uh, a woman of virtue, Proverbs 31 says, Who can find a virtuous and capable wife? She's more valuable than precious rubies. Her husband can trust her. She'll greatly enrich his life. She will not hinder him, but help him all of her life. Charm is deceptive. Beauty does not last. But a woman that fears the Lord will be greatly praised. You know, interesting, the word virtue is often thought of as a feminine word. Maybe you don't describe a man as virtuous. More, you might say that more of a woman, but it isn't a feminine word in the Bible. In fact, it's a word that's sometimes translated as a man and even as an army, the idea being that it speaks of something of force, but in its context in Proverbs 31, it's speaking of a woman. So put it all together and what do you have? You have a woman of strength, a woman of influence, a woman of power. Having said that, that does not mean that you should neglect your outward appearance. You still want to be as attractive as you can be. Nothing wrong with that. It's a good thing. But don't forget your inner beauty. We're told over in 1 Peter 3, what matters is not your outer appearance, the styling of your hair, the jewelry you wear, the cut of your clothes, but your inner disposition. Cultivate inner beauty, the gentle, gracious kind that God delights in. How many girls today give that much thought to their inner person? That is what makes a Christian woman so attractive. It really is. In fact, it's, uh, it's what drew me to the faith. You know, I've told you my story before. No one actually came up to me and shared the gospel. They did, but I never listened. They never really got a conversation going. I didn't have time for any of these Christians. But I saw a girl on my high school campus and I felt very attractive. Now, it's not that she was a beauty queen because she wasn't. But there was something about this girl that was different from other girls and I found out later she was a Christian or a Jesus freak as we called them back then. And I went to check out this thing she went to, this so-called Bible study, and ended up hearing the gospel and giving my life to Christ. Her inner beauty that shone through got my attention and helped to bring me to Jesus. So it's a powerful witness. But here's the thing. It not only draws a Christian man, it draws non-Christian men too. Because you're different than the other girls. You don't talk like the other girls. You don't act like the other girls. They may want to mess around with the other girls, but you're the kind of girl they want to marry. You're the kind of girl they want to be the mother of their children because you have virtuous qualities. So they come up to you and say, hey, how are you? Want to go out? And you say, well, I have to ask you a question first. Yeah, what? Are you a Christian? Why do you ask? Because I'm a Christian and I would only go out with a Christian. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian, baby. Come on. Guys will say anything they need to say to get what they want. Trust me on this. They're after something else, okay? That's why fathers are so protective of their daughters because they know how men think, okay? So a guy may say certain things to you, but listen, here's what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians six fourteen: Don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship, what friendship, what companionship does righteousness have with unrighteousness, or light with darkness, or Christ with the devil? Or what part does a believer have with an unbeliever? What happens is Christian girls often get romantically and tragically sometimes sexually involved with a non-believer and it ends up in them being drugged down 
So only look for a Christian. Let me take it a step further. Don't just look for a Christian guy or a Christian girl. Look for a godly man or woman. Not just someone that professes Christ. Look for someone that's a man of God, a woman of God. In fact, check this out. Find someone that's even more godly than you. How about that? Now sometimes you want to rush these things. You know, people get impatient. They get tired of being single. It's like I'm 18 and not married yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, and they want to rush it. We have to get married. We're in love. We're in love. How long have you known each other? A month? Slow down. Time is your friend. Then you'll find out they really are a Christian with the passing of time. The Bible says many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. 1 Corinthians 13 says love is patient. If it's real love, it will stand the test of time. But you know, sometimes you can wait a little too long. Reminds me of a story that occurred about Jake and Bessie. They were getting on in years. Jake was 92 and Bessie was 89 when they found each other and decided to get married. They were so excited. So they're strolling along arm in arm one day and they walk by a drugstore. And Jake says, let's go in here for a minute. And Bessie follows. And Jake sees a man in the back and says, are you the owner of this establishment? And the man says, yes. And Jake says, well, I want to tell you something. This is Bessie and we're going to get married. So I have a few questions for you. The pharmacist said, go ahead. Jake said, do you sell heart medication here? The man said, yes. How about uh, medicine for rheumatism and scoliosis? Yeah, we have that too. How about medicine for memory problems and arthritis and jaundice? Yes, we have a large variety, the druggist said. Well, what about vitamins, sleeping pills, Geritol, antidotes for Parkinson's disease? Absolutely, said the pharmacist. We have all of that. Now wait, do you have wheelchairs? And do you have walkers? And do you have those little scooter chairs? Yes, all speeds and sizes, the man said. And then Jake said, that does it. We'd like to register for our wedding gifts here. <laughs> so give it time before you get married. Because once you've made that commitment, you want to stay together. Listen, I believe that I have found the secret to a strong and lasting marriage. And I'm going to reveal it to you now. It happened on my wedding day. It's when I discovered it. There I stood next to my wife, Kathy. And Chuck Smith, who performed the ceremony, said, I now pronounce Greg and Lori, man and wife. As you know, my last name is Lori, which of course is a girl's name. <laughs> By the way, I heard that my whole life. Lori's a girl's name. Shut up. My wife's name is Kathy. So instead of pronouncing us Greg and Kathy, man and wife, he pronounced us Greg and Lori. <laughs> so here's my secret to a successful marriage. Marry yourself. It really <laughs> works out well. No. Listen, every marriage is going to be tested. Don't think you're the exception if you're going through a storm or a hardship. And the problem is a lot of people just buckle. They give in. Oh, we can't handle this. This is hard. I don't feel the love that I felt when we first got married. Oh, the honeymoon's over. Yeah, it's called marriage. It's called life. Hang in there. Listen, our marriage has gone through the greatest test ever in the last few years with the death of our son. I've read since then that a lot of marriages don't survive the loss of a child. It is traumatic, I have to tell you. And we're certainly not over it by any stretch of the imagination. It's something we deal with every day. But we've leaned on the Lord and we lean on each other. And my appreciation for my wife has only grown. It hasn't lessened. And I hope hers for mine has grown as well. You're going to go through storms in your marriage. Jesus at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, the sermon we'll be looking at in a moment, said, anyone who listens to my teachings in Matthew 7, 24, and obeys him as wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it's built on a rock. But anyone who hears my teachings and ignores them is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will fall with a mighty crash. 
This is a perfect picture of the family because we all have a foundation we build on. So my question to you is, is your marriage on the rock or is it on the rocks? Is it built on Jesus Christ or the shifting sand of human emotion? Notice that Jesus did not say, if the storms come or the rains come. No. When. It's when, baby. When. Only a matter of time and more storms will come. But if it's built on the Lord, you will be able to survive and even come through stronger as a result. Well, we're going to deal with what Jesus said about marriage and also what He said about divorce. So let's go to Matthew 5 and uh, we're going to read a few verses together. This is our series that we're calling Worldview. So this is the biblical worldview on singleness, marriage, and divorce. Jesus says, and by the way, just before I read these words, I love the fact that He just shifts gears to this. See, He's talking about other things, matters of the heart. He's telling us that we shouldn't have hatred in our heart and we should reconcile with those that we're having problems with and we shouldn't have lust in our hearts. And, and then he just shifts gears and goes to verse 31. Furthermore it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say unto you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. Whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. Now these are not the only words Jesus gave on this subject. He had more to say about it. So let's fast forward to Matthew 19. Just move forward in Matthew. Matthew 19. And this is a conversation he had with some Pharisees that were trying to put him on the horns of a dilemma. Paint him into a corner. Trap him. Matthew 19 verse 3. The Pharisees came to him testing him saying to him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus answered and said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they, no, they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let no man separate. Isn't it interesting how Jesus evades their question and goes back to the original plan. Yes, He gives His word on divorce. But first He says, Hey guys, don't miss the big picture here, which is why God brought Adam and Eve together in the first place. I mean, Adam and the Garden of Eden had it made. You want to talk about the ultimate bachelor pad? There He was. Location, location, location. You know, in the epicenter of perfection, beauty, glorious plant life and animal life and luscious fruit and everything a man could want except a companion. But he didn't know what was missing because it wasn't a what, it was a who. And so the Lord brought Eve to Adam. Why did God bring the woman to the man? According to Genesis 2.18, God said, I'm going to make a helper comparable to him or from the original Hebrew, someone who would assist another to reach fulfillment. It's even translated someone who rescues another. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And as he slept, we read in Genesis 2, 21 to 24, that the Lord took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And from the rib God made the woman. Adam awoke, he sees Eve, and he says, this is not bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So God made Eve from the rib of Adam. One thing you may not know is there was an occasion when Eve was very suspicious of Adam. And she accused him of seeing other women. Adam said, Eve, are you crazy? You're the only woman on the face of the earth. How could I be involved with other women? Well, he fell asleep and he was awakened by someone poking on his ribs. It was Eve. He said, Eve, what are you doing? She said, just counting your ribs. <laughs> That's not in the Bible, by the way, don't. That's just a stupid joke. Two words are given here in verse 24. A man leaves his father and mother and cleaves unto his wife. Those two words 
sum up what a marriage is all about. It's leaving and cleaving. Understand the word cleave doesn't mean to divide or separate as in using a meat cleaver. The word cleave here means to glue or to cling. So it's leave and cling. Sever and bond. Loosen and secure. Depart from and attach to. Listen. Marriage begins with a leaving. In effect, you are leaving all other relationships. And the closest relationship outside of marriage is specified here, implying that if it's necessary to leave your father and mother, then certainly all lesser ties must be broken, changed, or left behind. You're still a son or a daughter to your parents. You're still a sibling. But now your primary responsibility is to your husband and your wife. You see, this doesn't happen in some homes. The man never really leaves the parents and the woman never leaves her parents. No. A new family is now established. And your primary attention must be to meeting her needs, meeting his needs. I heard about one young man who was trying to please his parents in every way and find a girl they would both approve of. So he met a girl and brought her home and his mother didn't like her. But another girl brought her home and his mom didn't like her either. Met two more girls. Same thing happened. Finally he went out and found a girl that looked like his mother, walked like his mother, talked like his mother, brought her home. But then his dad didn't like her. See that was... <laughs> Why am I laughing at that? I've told that multiple times. That I just suddenly found it amusing. <laughs> As part of the leaving and cleaving, there needs to be communication. In fact, a survey was done among divorced couples, and they were asked the question, why did your marriage fail? 86% said, deficient communication. Got to talk. You know, I think Ray really played this out beautifully in his song about how he knows so many things about his wife. How well do you know your spouse? Listen, your spouse, your husband, your wife should be your best friend. Sure, she's your wife. Sure, he's your husband. Your best friend. That's how it ought to be. But here's the problem. Women are more verbal than men are. I think we can safely state that, right? There's exceptions, but generally that's true. Uh, experts tell us that women speak 50,000 words in one day. I believe this. I think some may exceed that. And men supposedly speak half that many, 25,000 words a day. I mean, you can even see this in the way that a, a woman, um, pick up the harvest magnet here, a woman well, women will talk. Have you ever watched women talk, like in a restaurant, a table full of women? It's just constant noise, you know. And, and, and they talk over each other. They're all talking at the same time. No one comes up for air. And guys, we watch it with amazement, like, what is happening? But somehow, despite the fact you're all talking, you're getting it. You're picking it up. You have like these special lines of communication, you know. Guys, different. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing? Can't complain. You know, it's just more like speak, listen, speak, listen. So a lot of times guys don't communicate enough. And you know, girls, you need to know that we feel all the emotions you feel. Maybe not all of them, but most of them. <laughs> we don't want to feel all the emotions you I won't go there. Kids. Third service, I'm getting into trouble. There's always the potential for a wacky statements, third service. That's why you come. <laughs> Let's watch Greg mess up again. <laughs> but uh, men don't communicate as much as they ought to. Sometimes just telling your wife you love her. Don't just think it, tell her. And wives, you could say that back to your husband as well. Sometimes a hug goes a long way. I heard about a husband and wife. They're having severe marital problems. So they went in to see a pastor for counsel. And after speaking with them several times, the pastor said, I, I think I've come up with what you guys need to do. And he got up from his chair, from behind his desk, walked around the front, uh, asked the man's wife to stand up, and he gave her a hug. And he turned to the husband and said, Sir, this is what you need to do for your wife every single day. The husband looked at the pastor for a moment and then said, what time do you want me to bring her back tomorrow? 
Oh. Spend time. <laughs> I don't write these jokes, folks. I just, I hear them and pass them along. Spending time with each other, communicating with each other, leaving and cleaving, these are essentials for a successful marriage. But why do marriages fall apart? What's the number one reason we read or hear cited as why the marriage did not make it? Ready? You know it. Irreconcilable differences. I'm so sick of hearing that. I've had irreconcilable differences with my wife for 36 years. <laughs> and I don't know that we're ever going to sort it out. You see, by nature, she's very neat and organized. I'm a bit on the messy side. She is sometimes late. I'm usually early. She likes the toilet seat down. I leave it up. We're still battling this one. Now she's got my granddaughter working on me. <laughs> Papa, put the seat down. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I raise boys. It's hard. Hard, hard habits to break. But you see, it's a funny thing how now we have irreconcilable differences, people will say. Why were you attracted to your mate in the first place? Probably because they were different than you. You like that about them. Oh, you know, they were more outgoing and you were more reserved or they were more this way and you were more that way. And oh, isn't it great? And, and together we're, we're a wonderful couple. And oh, now all of a sudden those things that attracted you to them are irreconcilable differences that cannot possibly be resolved. Hey, what happened to celebrating the differences? Viva la difference! <laughs> but we'll see people say, that's it. Marriage is over big mistake. You need to work it out. You need to resolve it. You need to get through it. See, back in the day of Jesus, uh, divorce was common. Don't forget the woman at the well was married and divorced five times. Was living with a man. And it was common because a lot of the liberal rabbis gave a lot of release clauses that favored the man over the woman. There was one rabbi of the day when Jesus was having this public ministry known as Hillel. He actually said incompatibility of temperament was grounds for divorce. Incompatibility of temperament. And a man could divorce his wife for burning his meal or embarrassing him in front of his friends. Or if a more attractive woman came along, he could divorce his wife. Well, that pretty much opens it up to everything. A poor woman could be divorced for all these ridiculous reasons, not reasons at all, but excuses, kicked to the curb. And so Jesus sets the record straight. Now let's go back to Matthew 9, verse 7. So they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? I want you to get your pen or pencil out and just underline a couple of words if you will, would. Underline the word command. Why did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, permitted, underline the word permitted, you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. I say whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries the one who is divorced commits adultery. So they're saying commanded. Jesus is saying permitted. He's saying, guys, you got it all wrong. Moses never commanded anyone to get a divorce. He permitted it. And why did he permit it? Because of the hardness or the callousness of your hearts. To protect the woman from the hardship of endeavoring to carry on in a home where she was unloved and unwanted because the man had failed to realize the high idea of marriage. A release clause was given. So when is divorce legitimately allowed? Two reasons. Number one, divorce is allowed when sexual immorality takes place. Divorce is allowed when sexual immorality takes place. Matthew 19, 9, Jesus says anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Back to our text from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 32. Whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. So, what is sexual immorality? Well, it's speaking of extramarital sexual relationships. It comes from the Greek word pornea. Guess what English word we get from that? 
pornographic. It's a word that can be translated a lot of ways. Clearly it covers extramarital relations, the so-called affair. It also includes incest, prostitution, homosexuality, all violations of the oneness that takes place between a man and a woman. In fact, Paul even said that if you have sex with a prostitute, you become one flesh with her. You see, there's a special bond that takes place when a man and a woman come together sexually, and that bond is violated when you are with someone else, and it becomes a release clause out of the marriage. It doesn't say you have to get a divorce if this happens. It says you could. Check this out. Immorality is not only grounds for divorce, it's also grounds for forgiveness. Immorality is not only grounds for divorce, it's also grounds for forgiveness. Even if unfaithfulness has taken place, if there is a way to forgive, try to find that way and save the marriage. But it is a release clause that Jesus gave. Number two, another reason is given in Scripture whereby God will permit divorce. It's called desertion. Desertion. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 talks about a woman that has a husband that does not believe. But if he's pleased to dwell with her, she should not put him away. So this is talking about being married to a non-believer. How does that happen? Well, it happens sometimes because Christians disobey God. They get impatient. They get tired of waiting. They say, I'm going to reach this guy or this girl for the Lord. They marry them and that person isn't coming to the Lord. In fact, they get harder and they're unbelief and the Christian is miserable and they don't understand why they made this decision. They're frustrated and then they meet some nice person at church that seems like a far better candidate to be married to. And I've had them come up to me and say, Greg, the, the Lord really spoke to me and said to me, dump the heathen dog and marry the Christian prince of a guy. What do you say? doesn't matter what I say. Here's what the Bible says. If the unbeliever is content to stay with you, don't leave. See, now your objective, your marching orders, is to try to win that man to the Lord. You can read 1 Peter 3 for more detail on that. Or if you're a guy, to win that girl to the Lord. That's your goal. Having said that, let's say that non-believer departs. Paul deals with that later in 1 Corinthians 7. If the unbeliever departs, a brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. The word bondage means held by constraint of the agreement. And sometimes a person will leave. So let's play this out. The person you're married to just one day says, I don't want to be married to you anymore. I'm done with you. And they walk out. Are you supposed to just stay married to them forever? Two years go by. Well, he'll be home one day. You know what? You've been deserted. And guess what? God's given you a release clause. Now, I'm not saying you have to divorce them. Maybe you'll want to hold on. Maybe they will come back. But if that unbeliever departs, let them depart. Now, you say, well, what if they say they're a Christian? Well, I'm going to go out and have this affair with this woman right now, but as a good Christian wife, I want you to wait for me and I'll come back maybe. Okay, praise God. No. <laughs> Paul says, you know what? You're not hell. Yeah, but my, but my husband said he's a Christian. A Christian would never do that. A Christian would never abandon his wife and his children. He wouldn't. And if he's a Christian, he's a very, or she is a very disobedient one. And Paul says, if you don't provide for your own family, you're worse than an infidel. I don't think the issue is if they claim to be a Christian or not. I think the issue is they abandon you and the Bible frees you. Okay, those are the two reasons given. The Bible doesn't say, unless it be for irreconcilable differences, or unless she's not as attractive to you as she once was, or unless he isn't doing everything you hoped he would do for you. No, these are the two reasons that are given in the Bible. Let me come back to something that I raised earlier and I'll close with this. Sometimes we're trying to meet the deepest need of our life with a person. We have unrealistic expectations. That's the problem. We've read too many sappy romance novels or watched too many stupid movies. I don't know what has contributed to it, but somewhere in our mind we're thinking that everything's going to be slow motion, runs on the beach, and you know, 
and, and we don't deal with reality. And we expect a man to be what a man could never be. And we expect a woman to be what she never could be. So we need to love our spouse and help them be the best person they can be. But we also need to realize what we long for deep down inside is God. Yes, one day your prince will come. And he'll be riding a white horse. And the second coming of Jesus Christ. Your prince is coming. <laughs> so even you guys can sing it. Doesn't sound masculine. Your prince is coming. He's returning again. And guess what? One day we're all going to live happily ever after. Not on earth, in heaven. And when heaven comes to earth, when Christ returns and the new Jerusalem comes down to this earth, yes. Oh, we'll have moments of great happiness on this earth. Count on it. You'll have moments of great sadness and disappointment on earth too. Count on that as well. You'll have sunny days, blue skies, and you'll have dark days of cloudy skies. But you'll have Jesus if you're a Christian walking with you through all of it. And you have the hope that one day in the future, not on this earth in this fallen state, but when God establishes His kingdom, there'll be lasting happiness. Until that day, we need to get ready because listen, we need Jesus. And every one of us have sinned. And every one of us have broken God's commandments. And every one of us have fallen short. And there's people here right now. You've gone from relationship to relationship. Hook up to hook up. Break up to break up. In some cases marriage to marriage. That was my mom. My mom was a beautiful woman. If you've read my book Lost Boy. Shameless promotion of book. Um, you've seen I put some photos of my mom. There's one on the cover. She looked like Marilyn Monroe. I'm not exaggerating. There were always guys flocking around my mom. And I think my mom was trying to fill a void in her life with men. And she was running from God for her whole life. And in the end of her life, sadly, her health broke down and the tolls of her alcoholism and her smoking and partying uh, had their way. And, and, and in the last moments of her life, the last weeks of her life, she committed her life to Jesus Christ. And that's, that's glory. I expect to see my mom in heaven. But I wish she would have done that sooner and not wasted all those years. She was raised as a Christian, but she ran from God her whole life. Maybe that's you. You know, your girl, you're thinking some guy's going to do it all for you. Wake up, girl. No guy's going to do that for you. You're some guy looking for this girl. Oh, I'm going to dump my wife. Dump. No, no. Stop with that. No person can do it. No thing can do it. No object, no car, no house, no amount of money. No experience. No sexual experience is going to do it. No drug. No alcohol. None of it's going to work. It's just going to exasperate your problem and make things worse. You need Jesus. And He's here right now standing at the door of your life and He is knocking. And He's saying if you'll hear His voice and open the door, He'll come in. In a moment we're going to pray and I'm going to give you an opportunity to get right with God and ask Christ to come into your life. If you've not done that, respond to this invitation right now as we pray. Father, speak now to every person here, especially those who do not know You. Help, Lord, them to see their need for You and help them to come to You this day we pray in Your name. Now while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and we're praying together. How many of you would say today, Greg, pray for me. I want my sin forgiven. I want Jesus Christ to come into my life. I want to know that when I die, I will go to heaven. I want to be ready for the Lord's return. Pray for me if that's your desire. If you want Jesus to come into your life and forgive you of your sin, if you want to go to heaven when you die, would you lift your hand up right now wherever you're sitting? And I'm going to pray for you. God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. God bless you. Just lift your hand up. Up in the balcony. God bless you. God bless you. In the back. God bless all of you. God bless you. Now I'm going to ask that every one of you that just lifted your hand, if you would, stand to your feet and I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. Right where you stand. You that lifted your hand, just stand to your feet and I'm going to lead you in a prayer. God bless 
Each one of you standing. Up there in the balcony, stand to your feet. If you're outside, you stand to your feet there as well. Even though I can't see you, you stand up too, please. Anybody else? Stand up. Many are standing, by the way. So don't feel you'll be the only one. You want Christ in your life. You want your sin forgiven. You've fallen away from the Lord and you want to come back to Him. Stand up now. I'll pray for you. This final moment, stand up. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand up. Stand up now. Up in the balcony, stand up. God bless you. This final moment, if you're going to stand, stand now. God bless. All right, all of you that are standing right now, I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. And this is where you're asking Christ to come into your life. Again, as I pray, pray this out loud after me. Pray now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But you died on the cross and shed your blood for every sin I have ever committed. I turn from that sin now. I put my faith in you. Fill this void in my life. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. Make me ready for your return. Thank you for loving me and calling me and accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's welcome these folks that just prayed that prayer. God bless you, God. God bless you.